Thank you so very much, Nancy, and good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming out. And I, it's a real honor and blessing to be here. I've never been to the university before, and gosh, there's like 50,000 students around here. <laughs> but I really want to thank Anne and Nancy for welcoming me, because the University Y, you have had a Friday Forum for 92 years? How about that? That round of applause. Did you all know that? That's an amazing accomplishment. And I hope you all heard my friend Kathy Kelly, who spoke last week. Great. One of the great peacemakers in the world. Um, well, I'm real happy to be here, and I'm real nervous, and in front of you serious university people, research people. <clears throat> I'm reminded of the true story of the young priest who's giving his first sermon, and he's really nervous, and he comes to the microphone, and he says, he taps on the microphone and says, something's wrong with this microphone, and the congregation goes, and also with you. <laughs> hey, that's my best joke, everybody. It's going to be, boy, that didn't work. Yeah, you probably heard that 20 years ago. I'm sorry. I was trying to cheer you up. It's going to be downhill from there. We're going to talk about climate change. No, you know, uh, I'm so moved that your series, Nancy, is called Resist, Building a Culture of Nonviolence. I mean, it's the most important thing we could do with our lives. Um, the culture of violence is a complete and total failure and disaster. It's destroying us all, personally, interiorly. And I'm sure you could tell me stories about Champaign-Urbana and Chicago, but the country and the world. And our only hope is the methodology and vision and way of nonviolence from Jesus to Dr. King. I'm just back Monday from Rome and spent a week at the Vatican last week on this conference. The, it's the third time we've been there um, try, on, on building a culture of nonviolence, Nancy. It's just your title. And we're trying to get Pope Francis to write an encyclical on nonviolence. What do you think of that? And we're getting really close. Did you see the news this morning? We left and some of our African friends were having a retreat with the leaders of the war in South Sudan, where 400,000 people were killed, millions have fled. And I know these people, the, the church people who are all saints. But they had the rebel leaders and the president and the former president and yesterday afternoon, the Pope met with them, started crying, begging for peace and then fell to his knees in front of each one of them and kissed their feet, begging for peace. Wow, it's an exciting time to be alive, that we have such a, a, a peacemaker like that, and that's what we're all called to be. I'm mindful, I always think of Martin Luther King 51 years ago, just before the government killed him, the night before in Memphis, Tennessee, he stood up there, his last words in the famous speech were, if you read the fine print, the choice is no longer violence or nonviolence. That's not what we're talking about. What is it, Martin? It's nonviolence or non existence. That's what Dr. King said the night before he was killed. Unless the whole human race becomes nonviolent and works to build a global grassroots movement of nonviolence, leading humanity back from the brink of non existence, we're doomed, Martin said. That's what we're all coping with right now in the news in these terrible days. Um, and so Ann and Nancy asked me to talk about my new book about nonviolence and earth and climate change. Maybe I could tell some stories and talk a little bit about the book and nonviolence and take some questions. And then, Ann, by the end, we will have resolved everything. Yeah, you're not believing that either. I, uh, I want to shout out to my friends in the back corner, you holy freshmen. Nice to see you. Um, I uh, was not like you. They are studying global concerns here at the university, freshmen. I was a wild college kid at Duke in the 70s. It's a long, sad story, but basically, I got knocked off the fraternity bar stool, saw the light, realized I had to give my whole life to Jesus, and my next thought was, oh my God, I'm going to have to become a Jesuit actually what happened to me. My parents were so appalled, they begged me to wait a year. So I thought, what am I going to do? Well, if I'm going to give my life to this guy, I think I should go and get the lay of the land. This is what happened to me. So 
I go to my parents, I'm a 21-year-old dopey kid, and I say, Mom, Dad, I'm going on a holy pilgrimage to hitchhike through Israel for three months to see where Jesus lived. And my mother went, it's worse than we thought. <laughs> and the week I left, Israel invaded Lebanon. And all the Holy Land pilgrimages were canceled. Do you remember, some of you, the Summer War of 1982, where the Pentagon organized the killing in three months of 60,000 people? Who cares? And I was oblivious to it and walked through Israel for three months with just a little Bible, just camping out at the Sea of Galilee, you know, getting the lay of the land. And there's nobody there, and I'm oblivious to everything, being, being a dopey kid. And, it was a Wednesday afternoon, and there's a little chapel on the north side of the Sheet Sea, if you've been there, smaller than this room, with eight-sided wall walls, you know. And I walked into the church, and it said on the wall of the church, if you can imagine, like graffiti, right there, in the church, it said, blessed are the poor. And I went, huh, what's that about? And I look up, and it says next, blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those persecuted for working for justice on the altar. Love your enemies, the chapel of the Beatitudes. Well, I never thought about them my whole life. And a light went on, and I think I said out loud in the church, oh my God, I think he's serious. I thought you'd laugh at that, that was pretty funny. And I just couldn't believe, because my plan was to be a pious Jesuit, which I know is an oxymoron, but anyway, um, you know, just a really nice guy. And uh, I walk out on the balcony, and when you're on holy pilgrimage after months, you get wackier than ever, and I'm looking up at the sky, and there's the whole Sea of Galilee, and I'm talking to God, and I'm going, are you kidding me? Like, this is what you want me to do? Isn't this the job of the pope or the bishop? Like this is the job description of the Christian to live the Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount and you want me to do that? And I thought and I thought and I thought and I said, okay, I promise to give my life to the Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount, thank you very much, on one condition, if you give me a sign. Wasn't that just brilliant? Because <laughs> I found a loophole. And all of a sudden, there were these loud explosions as three Israeli jets fell from the sky, swooping down over the Sea of Galilee, flying 15 miles away to the border of Lebanon where they dropped a bunch of bombs and killed people. And it changed my life. The next day, I walked up to the border and saw thousands of soldiers roaming, rolling into Lebanon. And I decided there and then that, I, in fact, I would spend my life on this that this in fact is the job description, that this is what it means to be a Christian, to live these teachings, which are the most neglected thing in all of Christianity, especially among Christians in the US. Well, anyway, I was, the next thing you know, I'm with the great Daniel Berrigan, you know, some of you know my friend, who's a great peacemaker, and then I was living in El Salvador at the height of the war with the Jesuits who were later killed. Well, if you've known people who've been assassinated, and I've known many, and I've been in many war zones around the world, then it's really easy to walk onto a military base, as I did in 1993 with Philip Berrigan, right through thousands of soldiers at four in the morning, the Seymour Johnson Air Force Base, where they had the F-15E, bigger than this room. I just walked right through them, pulled out a little hammer, and went up to the side of the, one of the nuclear fighter bombers and hammered once on it, as you do. Normal Christian behavior. As I said to the judge later, uh, Your Honor, um, <clears throat> I'm just doing what it said in the Bible. Someday these people are going to come along and beat swords into plowshares. Was there a problem? Uh, Your Honor, I'm just following the commandment Jesus gave in the Sermon on the Mount. Love your enemies, don't nuke them. That's the actual translation from the original Greek. I'm trying to make you laugh and it's not working. He didn't laugh either. And for that action, I faced 20 years in jail. I did about eight months in a tiny cell with Philip Berrigan, never left the cell. Could never vote again. I'm highly monitored. And um, 
I'm an ex-con, as high up a terrorist as you can get, according to the government. Now I have a serious problem with recidivism, which you heard about, so maybe we shouldn't even talk about it. <laughs> but anyway, my journey led me to the Fellowship of Reconciliation, and then I was living in New York City with Daniel Berrigan, my friend Eric Stoner, who's here today. And um, September 11th happened. I went down to volunteer. The Red, head of the Red Cross met me by chance, asked me to coordinate all the chaplains working with the families. I did that for three months. We had 600 chaplains ministering to 50,000 direct relatives. And on Saturdays, we were organizing the main marches in Times Square against the bombing of Afghanistan. And the New York Times wrote about me. And the Jesuits had so many complaints, I was kicked out of New York. So I moved to New Mexico, poorest state in the country, because I had friends there who said, well, when they finally catch up to you, move here, because like, who cares? And we started a campaign at Los Alamos where they're building every nuclear weapon ever. And um, during those days, in September 11th, I was reading the entire collected works, the 100 volumes of Gandhi for this book I wrote, Mohandas Gandhi Essential Writings. Dan said I had overdosed on Gandhi and needed a 12-step group, but that's it. <laughs> Did you know Gandhi read from the Sermon on the Mount every morning and every evening for 40 years. Dr. Stoner, did you know that? He's not even a Christian. I thought that was pretty funny too. He's Hindu. He's saying, I want to be a person of nonviolence. Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is the greatest teachings of nonviolence in history. So I have to read it every morning and every evening. It's like a handbook, how to be a human being. And that's how he became Gandhi. He tried to let his life change according to the words. That had a huge impact on me. I started teaching the Sermon on the Mount and reading it regularly, and uh, that led me to, um, this is my little show and tell, uh, why I'm about this book, to write a book on the Sermon on the Mount, The Beatitudes of Peace. And <clears throat> what I discovered, there's this, I don't know if you know scripture schol uh, scholarship, all the rage right now, is the actual language that Jesus spoke, which is gone. Um, and, uh, but this guy in France spent his whole life translating the Lord's Prayer and the Beatitudes into the Greek <clears throat> from the unknown language into English and so forth. And he says, we're all wrong with the translation. Isn't that interesting? It's not blessed are the peacemakers, aren't you nice? You're so nice. Like it's a passive thing. Not at all. It has like five English words. When Jesus says, blessed are, blessed are, it's arise, get up, start walking, get moving, and walk forth. All you poor, mournful, meek, and you hunger and thirst for justice. Arise and get moving, you peacemakers. Isn't that fantastic? You're looking at me like this guy's had way too much coffee, which is true, I've been drinking coffee. But that just got me going. That sounds like the nonviolent Jesus, empowering his people. Well then, I was writing a book on Thomas Merton, as you do, and uh, it's out there somewhere, I forgot to bring it up. And he wrote in a very obscure, difficult postdoctoral essay on nonviolence called Blessed are the Meek in 1965. And Merton says this word meek, which is runs throughout the Psalms, is actually the biblical word for nonviolence. Not the word love and not the word peace. But it's a terrible word. Again, oh, you're so meek. It means passivity, doing nothing. Merton. Thomas Merton, you all know our, our guy. He says that's not it at all. In the original Hebrew, the word is active, creative, daring, public, organized, nonviolence, like Martin Luther King. Well, that pushes all my buttons. Did you know that? Eric, did you know that? You knew that, Eric. Did. So that means arise, get up, get moving, all you people like Martin Luther King. This is very exciting. Well, one day I'm sitting on the mountaintop where I live in New Mexico, way off the grid, at 8,000 feet, and I'm thinking these things. I'm going, wait a second. If Merton's right, and the guys on the Sermon on the Mount, the scripture, and Gandhi are right, if you're doing the math here, 
Jesus is talking about active, creative nonviolence. And who can imagine the mind of Jesus? He's a genius. I know that's a stupid thing to say, but you get the, you know, it's easy to get. Okay. Active, creative nonviolence leads to oneness with creation. Blessed are the meek, they will inherit the earth. My whole life, I never heard anybody talk about that. And that's why I wrote this book, they will, they will Inherit the Earth. Jesus is saying active, creative nonviolence leads to total oneness with Mother Earth. And I got thinking, well, why did I never hear that? Well, in the year 315, when Constantine the Emperor became Christian, which is an illegal religion, overnight he says, all you Christians are now legal, and you can also kill for the Roman army. And let's throw out the Sermon on the Mount. He turned to Cicero the pagan and began to come up with the just war theory. And for 1,700 years, we've totally rejected the nonviolence of Jesus, if you're with me. So if doing the math, the mind of the nonviolent Jesus, if you're with me here in my theory, active creative nonviolence leads to oneness with creation. Well, if you reject the nonviolence of Jesus, and uphold and support and participate in the culture of active, creative violence, you will not be one with the earth. You, according to the mind of Jesus, isn't that amazing and interesting? You're disconnected with the earth and catastrophic climate change. Seems to me normal then in the mind of the nonviolent Jesus. So I... I think this is very important teaching and even perhaps a way forward for us in a bad time. I've gotten to know my friend Bill McKibben. He's one of the environmental leaders of 350.org. And he goes, John, you're the first person on the planet to connect nonviolence with the environment. I said, no, Jesus did that 2,000 years ago. He went, oh, yeah, I forgot. Because <laughs> who, who reads the Sermon on the Mount but Gandhi and Martin Luther King? It's a good thing to be thinking about these great things because this is such a terrible time and we could spend all afternoon getting really depressed about all the bad things happening. I like Harry Potter, I'll just say he who shall not be named. <laughs> Lying, greeting, racist, sexist, war-making sociopath. How am I doing here, Nancy? You get this. But he's just a symbol of the culture of violence that's destroying the planet. It's the whole system of violence. It's like we're living in a zombie movie. Or, you know, we're globally addicted to violence and death. So that there's dozens of wars happening that we are involved in, every one of them. We've got 15,000 nuclear weapons good to go. We have over 750 military bases and over 150 nations. Well, you could go through total racism, police brutality, mass incarceration, sexism, executions, tax breaks for the corporations, supporting guns while doing nothing to stop gun massacres, turning away our poor immigrant sisters and brothers, building walls and prisons instead of schools and hospitals, get, letting the poor get poorer and sicker, while the 1% of the 1% of the 1%, 80 people have over half the money in the planet. I mean, it's so totally unjust and waging permanent war on Mother Earth and the creatures. Uh, I think it's so scary and depressing that we just numb it out and don't even talk about it. So let me talk about it for two minutes because it's the only way to just, for, to just say what we all know. And I'm going to put it simply because it's the only way I can say it. For my book, I was studying climate change for 10 years and going to conferences and with scientists and really reading those awful reports. And another big one came out Monday saying that uh, all the glaciers will be gone, you know, in 50 years. The Alps will be totally melted. I mean, that's just Monday. Did you see the report three weeks ago that said there will be no more clouds? No more clouds. That's where the world is headed. Well, hmm. The fossil fuel industry has been digging up oil and gas and coal for 100 years, filling the atmosphere with carbon, so the temperature is rising, the polar ice caps melting, the ocean levels rise, the storms are getting bigger, the rich are getting richer, 
The Pentagon's getting even richer. They love this. They're preparing for full-on global war now. Hottest years on record, massive hurricanes, tornadoes, superstorms, rain bombs. What was this thing that just hit Minnesota yesterday? The snow bomb again. Floods, tsunamis, droughts, fires. But no, by the end of the century, the sea level could go two inches to six inches to 10 inches, which means everybody on the planet living, it was 40% of humanity living along the coast has to move. So instead of 60 million refugees like we have now, you have at least 600 million refugees, which means we have 100 wars happening in the next 50, 75 years. All of that has all been laid out by the science. Well, the world can't take the fossil fuels out of the ground anymore, to put it stupidly. And we can't be spending trillions of dollars for war. We need to be cleaning up the environment and getting at the roots of violence, which is economic justice and so forth, and funding nonviolent conflict resolution and renewable sources of energy and solar and wind power. And the only way that's going to happen, the only way that's going to happen, the only way that's going to happen, unanimous across the planet from the environmental movement and the peace movement is a global grassroots movement of nonviolence, the likes of which the world has never seen, way beyond Gandhi and Dr. King. That's the challenge before all of us, in my opinion. So we've got two choices. We can say, well, that's not possible. It's so depressing and so awful, and there's nothing I can do, and life is horrible, and I'm just going to give up and be despairing and numb out and be depressed and do nothing and be spiritually dead, or we could arise, get up, get moving, and start walking forth and become the people Martin Luther King dreamed of. Like never before, even if you've been an activist all your life, to redouble and triple our efforts, to be part of this new, global grassroots movement of nonviolence, which is happening, that can lead humanity back from the brink of non-existence. And that, like Dr. King, we give our lives to this, like the saints we've known and the people who you brought in to speak here, especially Kathy Kelly. That, that, to me, is the great hope. Martin says there's a way forward. That's why I use this clumsy word, and I was saying this last week at the Vatican. These cardinals are going, huh? I'm going, love doesn't work anymore as a word, you know? I love my car. In Los Alamos, they consider themselves the greatest peacemakers of all times. They're all Christians who build nu our nuclear weapons. Hitler was all for peace. George W. Bush and he who shall not be named were all for peace. And Obama won the Nobel Peace Prize and actually spent more for war than George W. Bush. He actually did more for war, if you, if you read the fine print. So Dr. King uses this clumsy word from Gandhi, active nonviolence, which means what? It's a spirituality. It's a way of life, it's a tactic, it's a strategy, and it's a political methodology of social change that always works if you organize for it. And you're looking at me like, what? Yeah, it's a new kind of language. That's what we're trying to get Pope Francis to use. In the last year, he's been calling over and over, we've been studying the speeches for a culture of nonviolence. We've got him using your phrase, Nancy. And it's very hopeful, and that's what he was saying yesterday. The only way change happens is bottom-up people power grassroots movements of nonviolence. But nonviolence is a personal ethic. It's an interpersonal way of life. It's a spiritual path to the God of peace, and it's a methodology. Now, if Martin were here, Martin Luther King, he'd say, no, John doesn't understand nonviolence. In the last couple of years of his life, he'd get up there and he'd go, he'd define nonviolence like this. Nonviolence is power. I just love that. You're not powerless. Oh, no, we're powerless. There's nothing we could do. No, you have a power. If you're part of the movement, this is the best thing you could do with your life, with the short time we have on Earth. So we're making a difference globally to disarm the planet and transform it into a new culture of nonviolence, the likes of which the world has never seen. That's our mission. So I wrote this other book a couple of years ago, which I brought here, The Nonviolent Life. And here's my thesis. See what you think of this. Because I've been trying to articulate nonviolence and it hasn't been going over too well. So I propose that nonviolence requires three simultaneous attributes. You've got to do all three, okay? We're usually good at one of them. Maybe some great people make it to two, 
but few do all three. But you got to do all three. Number one, you got to be totally nonviolent to yourself from now on. Really nonviolent. We're all wounded people of violence. We're not going to beat ourselves up anymore. We're not going to be violent toward ourselves. We're going to non cooperate with our inner violence, try to make peace with ourselves, disarm ourselves. Um, and practice nonviolence inside our hearts. That's why I think all of this, all the great peacemakers in history said active, creative nonviolence requires prayer and daily meditation to allow the God of peace to disarm our hearts, to let go of all the roots of violence within us. And you know, you leave the nice peace talk and you get in the car and you want to run somebody over. <laughs> and then you get mad at yourself. But Thich Nhat Hanh, the great teacher, says, no, just look deeply within. That's a beautiful teaching. What's going on? Why do I run, want to run over somebody after church on Sunday? Well, it's because what happened a month ago when somebody hurt you, and all that's festering in you, and we have to keep letting it go. We want to radiate personally the peace we seek politically. OK, while you're doing your inner work, at the same time, the same time, number two, you want to practice meticulous interpersonal nonviolence toward every human being on the planet and the creatures and Mother Earth. How's that going for you? To be totally nonviolent to your spouse, your parents, your kids, your neighbors, your friends, your coworkers, the people in town or at the job you don't like, everybody in church, it's going to be rough. I thought you'd laugh at that, but maybe I touched a nerve. Um, and the whole world to have an attitude of nonviolence. And so I invite you to think about who is it who pushes all your buttons? You know, who makes you want to be violent? And it's very strange because that person is your teacher, a gift from God to you. Because that person's showing you how violent you are. And the invitation is to try to go and practice Gandhian, Kingian nonviolence with that person. How can you be working to end war and climate change if you can't work with that person? And we have this whole methodology and tons of books and resources like we've never had before. But what about the creatures and Mother Earth? You know, And that's what uh, I invite you to reflect on. How can we begin to be more nonviolent? Well, while you're doing that third, the same time, you have to have one foot involved in the global grassroots movement of nonviolence. You have to be involved in the struggle. Pick a cause and get involved. So you're doing your inner work, all your relationships in the movement. Well, I can see you didn't like my little three points. Yeah. The, well, this is what I, I think is the greatest thing we can do with our lives right now. It's the heart of the spiritual life, rising to the occasion, becoming like Gandhi and Dr. King and Dorothy Day and all our peacemakers. In my book, I end with a long list I call Mother Earth Rules about how do we go forward to live this mysterious teaching from 2,000 years ago of being people of active nonviolence who live at one with the earth. And I, I give a couple of key points, and I thought I'd close with some of them. Number one, and this is what I've been thinking about and what I wrote about, and maybe it's not what you've been thinking about, but. This is my kind of antidote to what, what's happening right now. Number one, grief. All the greatest teachers on the planet right now are saying the first and newest spiritual practice required of this terrible moment we're living in is grief. We all have to start taking formal time, like at least once a week when you're out for your walk or your meditation, to grieve. What we're doing to our sisters and brothers around the planet, what we're doing to the creatures, six million going extinct within 20 years, species, um, what we've done to Mother Earth, to really feel it. And you're going, no, 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 I'm angry, or I'm afraid, or I'm depressed. If you read the Sermon on the Mount, and I've written that, this all over the place, Jesus says, and Gandhi, I think, is the only one who gets this, and a few others. Whatever you do, don't get angry and don't be afraid. He gives instructions on the emotional life of the peacemaker. And I'm like, hey, those are our best things. If you've been involved in the peace movement, if you're not angry, what? well, that won't sustain you for the long haul. 
and your fear and numbness will just make you paralyzed, and you're no help to anybody. But Jesus actually recommends two emotions which none of us practice. And I already said one of them. Grief. Blessed are those who mourn. It's the second sentence of his teaching. Isn't that interesting? Because he's talking about people who mourn, and grief is not a bad thing. It's dealing with reality. But what happens when you grieve is your heart breaks. And we're not good at that as Americans. We're hard hard. We let our heart breaks. Then we can become more compassionate, more loving. Um, and that leads to action. The other thing Jesus recommends is joy. So I invite you to reflect on that. Second, like Jesus and Dr. King, we have to become people, how shall I put this, of total nonviolence. Yeah, that didn't go over well either, Eric. I mean, we have to really rethink our lives. From the, this day to the day we die, how can we go deeper into nonviolence? Where is the challenge of violence? Where are we still nursing violence in ourselves? Because, you know, some of us are, well, like those three points that I gave to be nonviolent to yourself, like in the churches, there's a lot of really nice people out there. I remember one person, the first time I ever gave a talk in 1985, she said, I'm going to spend my whole life being really peaceful. And when I finally reach it after 70 years, then I'll get involved in your struggle. That's not the gospel. It's not Christianity. That's not nonviolence. If you're just working on your inner stuff while the world is going to hell, as Tutu would say, you're part of the problem. Your silence is complicity with the structure. But the flip side of us, there's a lot of us hardcore activists. And we're mad and mean and nasty. And we're all for peace. And it's just not working. I thought you'd laugh at that too, but maybe I touched your. You see what I'm talking about here. So how can we deepen our nonviolence? And I mean getting rid of our guns not sending our kids off to join the military, not supporting the war, teaching nonviolence, promoting nonviolence, forming nonviolent study groups, learning how nonviolent conflict resolution works, and going deeper and deeper into love. I mean, nonviolence is active love that pursues the truth of our common unity, that we're all one with the whole human race and creation. It's so beautiful. This is worth giving our lives for, that we're gonna practice Unconditional, non-retaliatory, universal love. Isn't that fantastic? With one catch, there is no cause for whichever you and I will ever again support the taking of a single human life. We do not kill people. We do not support the killing of people, no matter what they tell us. We don't kill people who kill people to show them that they shouldn't kill people. And we give our lives to stop the killing. This is the basic boundary that nonviolence sets up so that you can create a new culture of peace and allow love and justice and compassion to flourish. I invite you to think about this. So total nonviolence. Third, Thich Nhat Hanh is very helpful in teaching us to practice contemplative mindfulness, I'll call it, in the present moment at one with creation. Because one of the, what's happened, how we got to this terrible moment where we're destroying the planet and each other is we're, we totally don't see that we're one with the earth. So I invite you, and this is in all the great leaders on the planet are saying, as you rethink your life and what you eat and what you wear and how you live and drive and your participation in the structure, the destruction of the earth and others, also, try to take more and more time to be one with nature and the creatures and really notice it in the present moment as a spiritual gift and let the earth heal you and disarm you and encourage you to go forth as a peacemaker for the rest of your life. Um, and fourth, I would say, uh, to quote Nancy, resist. We have to stand up publicly and speak out and say no to this culture of violence, whatever way you can. And uh, I like what Archbishop Romero said the day he was killed. Nobody can do everything, but everybody can do something. Everybody can make a difference. Everybody can be Rosa Parks, that tipping point person, 
to lead to an explosion of the movement. Because nonviolence becomes contagious. We saw this, was it last year, with the incredible students from Parkland who turned around this disaster to get millions of people to take to the streets for an end to gun violence. That's how nonviolence works. Only you and I want to connect all the dots. So it's not just the guns, but the war, and the big guns, the nukes, and the executions, and the racism, and sexism, and the greed, and the poverty, and the destruction of the earth. It's all one spectrum of violence that we're resisting as we hold up a coming of a new culture of nonviolence. In your brochure here, you see what I'm working on. We have a national week of action every September around um, International Peace Day, which is September 22nd. This September will be our sixth week. Last year, we had 2,660 events in all 50 states. You probably didn't even know about it. We started this seven years ago, my friends and I, and we said, let's call the whole country to take to the streets against everything. And gosh, it's working. This year we're on track. We already have 1,700 events registered. I invite you to do something here in Champaign-Urbana. And you're not alone. You'll be part of grassroots events. So study our website. I'm also working on the Nonviolent Cities Project based on Carbondale, Illinois, which is trying to get the entire community to be nonviolent through the city council, the police, the school system, the healthcare system. It's really exciting. We have 50 cities working on that right now. I could tell you more about that. I'm working with the Vatican, too. It was incredible a couple of years ago when I was there. Uh, the, the Pope didn't show up at the opening conference, so the number two guy, Cardinal Turkson, got up and read a speech from the Pope, and I was utterly appalled. Bless me, for I have sinned. I went up to him, and I shouldn't tell you this, but I hit him. I was trying to get his attention. Cardinal Turkson, I went like that. Uh, well, you go to the Vatican. It's pushed all my buttons. I go, we, we need you to get Pope Francis to write an encyclical, to get rid of the just war theory, and to make the nonviolence of Jesus central to every Christian on the planet. And without missing a beat, Cardinal Turkson hit me right back and goes, I know who you are. I read all your books. And he hit me and goes, I need you to write next year's World Day of Peace message for Pope Francis. Did you see it? Nonviolence, the style of politics, January 1st, 2017, the first statement on nonviolence in the history of the Catholic Church in 2,000 years since the Sermon on the Mount. What do you think of that? Kind of it up there. So my friends and I are part of that, and I'm feeling very hopeful about it. Well, the last point I would, well, I could go on and on, as you see, to be visionaries of nonviolence. That's, I think what we're experiencing, you know, one of the great casualties of this world is uh, the imagination. People can't even imagine a world of peace, a world without war or nuclear weapons. You talk about that here on the streets of Champaign-Urbana. People think you're crazy. But this is what peacemaking is about, and especially in a time of climate change and global violence. Uh, my heroes are the abolitionists. I've really studied them. They're crazy. 200 years ago, they go around like Frederick Douglass and William Lloyd Garrison and say, <coughs> Lloyd Garrison's famous speech, 1821. Today, we are announcing the abolition of slavery. You can't even say that with a straight face, because, what are you, crazy? You're going to get rid of slavery. That's what they told them. You can't. There's always been slavery. No, 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 there's always been slavery. It's in the Bible. Some people aren't people. And he said, no. A new world is coming. He reclaimed the imagination for a vision of human equality. And once that vision gets out there, a movement can be built toward uh, abolition, which is what they did in England without a civil war. Our job, what you've been trying to do, Nancy, with this series, especially having Kathy Kelly, is harder than Frederick Douglass. We, for the rest of our lives, have to stand up and say, today, we are announcing the abolition of war and poverty, and racism, and sexism, and nuclear weapons, and the destruction of the earth. And everybody's going to go, you're totally crazy. We're going to go, no. A new world is coming. 
a new world of peace and nonviolence, a new culture of peace and nonviolence. We have to help each other envision it. Jesus called it the kingdom of God on earth. That's what you're trying to do. That's what you've been trying to do as peacemakers, and I urge you to keep at it. It's the greatest thing we can do with our lives. And um, we needed more than ever to do our part, to be one with the earth, one with humanity, to rise to the occasion, to become like Gandhi and Dr. King and Dorothy Day, people of total nonviolence, and then to get moving and keep walking forward. Thank you very much for listening, everybody. I'm really grateful. Well, thanks so much. We have a little time for a rebuttal. <laughs> Our comments are questions. Start us off. Yeah, real loud. Say your name, too. Uh, I'm Paul. You, uh, as a secular guy, I always ask this question. Uh -huh. It's what you do when you have a, a very radical, brilliant uh, Christian. What do you do about the dominionist faction of Christianity? Do you have outreach to them? Do you... Would, to would you... Yes. Yeah. 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 Was there another question out there somewhere? Did I see a question over here? So the question was something I heard the word dominionist and I almost passed out. It was what do you do with basically Christians who want to kill everybody, blow up the planet, and get it ready for Jesus? We're going to do that by killing everybody. Boy, we're so far from understanding Jesus. That's why it's very interesting to me that Gandhi read the Sermon on the Mount every day. I actually went to India with Gandhi's grandson to see the place where he did this for a month. Made a little retreat in Gandhi's house. But I know this is true. Well, that's why only Gandhi and Dr. King reached these kind of heights. What do you do? I, uh, well, and forgive me for being such a name dropper, I was blessed to know Mother Teresa. I worked with her for years on the death penalty, and I would watch her, and she, it was all an act. You know, she'd just go, Jesus. And I thought, that's a good idea. So I've been through everything and faced massive crowds and debates and Christians, <laughs> the Vatican. Oh, we're being filmed, I better be careful. Um, and I say, yeah, that's all fine. Let's kill everybody. But um, just what about Jesus? And I remember somebody go, what do you bring him up for? What does he have to do with this? This was one of my parishioners who wanted to kill everybody in Iraq. Gandhi said, uh, when everybody finally becomes nonviolent, God will reign on earth as God does in heaven. That's a very profound teaching of eschatology. And what we, what the insanity of violence has done is, of course, infected our theology and spirituality, our understanding of church, anthropology, what it means to be a human being. To be a human being is to be nonviolent. To be in the church is to be in the community of nonviolence. Gandhi's saying that the end of the world is total nonviolence. No, we think. If we kill all those horrible people, then Jesus will come. What are we just crazy? You have to teach and educate and talk to people that Jesus was nonviolent. Gandhi said Jesus is the most active person of nonviolence in the history of the world. And the only people on the whole planet who don't know that Jesus is nonviolent are Christians. This is what I've tried to do with my life. And my greatest, I, I expect the generals and death squads that I've been with and police to be violent, and I talk to them, but it's very, very, very painful to be with church people and Christians and bishops who are all for killing. I once had an archbishop say to me, you don't have to follow Jesus anymore. God cannot protect us. Our, his actual sentence was our only security is in nuclear weapons. Um, a tutu said something like that to me, and that's why I wrote him, and I said, have you ever read the Sermon on the Mount? And then he nominated me for the Nobel Peace Prize. Because he said, I don't know anybody who talks like you on the whole planet. Um, but it's right there. So our job is to practice the nonviolence of Jesus, tell everybody that Jesus is nonviolent, if you're in terms of Christians, and try to educate people. And it's hard, because you have to be nonviolent in doing it. This is why I've had all these doors shut in my face. 
But oddly enough, the Vatican doors are open right now because of this unusual guy. So we're going for it, you know, and we're, I've spent all last week laboring, trying to teach the nonviolence of Jesus to cardinals. And I can't even begin to tell you some of the conversations, but in the end, it was very, very good. They just never heard this before. And that's what we have to talk about. And to use my, you know, my friend calls it name dropping. Talk about Jesus. I thought you'd laugh. That's what Steve Kelly used to say to Dan Berg and I, oh, you name dropper. But you say, well, Jesus was nonviolent. We have to be nonviolent. And that's how people can begin to change. Anybody else have another question or comment or suggestion? Bob. So the question is about the just war doctrine. That's exactly what we're working on in the Catholic Church right now. It's very much. It's incredibly shocking. And you may have seen the statement from the April 2016 conference where we called for the total rejection of the just war theory because there is no such thing as just war theory or just war. There is no such thing. It was made up, but you, know, you go back 1,700 years ago to Constantine, and then you get St. Augustine to start writing about it. St. Augustine has a sentence in the city of God where he says, you know, sometimes the best way to love your enemies is to kill them. They want to be killed. What are you, crazy, Augustine? Like, we know better than Jesus, too, by the way. Jesus doesn't say, at the height of the Sermon on the Mount, love your enemies. But if they're really bad and you follow these seven conditions, bomb the hell out of them. You know, I always imagine this violent Jesus smoking a cigarette. No, love your enemies, then you're really like God, is what he says. So the church has been involved in killing everybody, blessing every war, every aspect of violence, and I never expected in my life, I've been full-time at this for 40 years now, to see what I've been seeing the last few years. Now, if you read the fine print, in terms of the Catholic Church, but it's happening in other churches, there's more happening on nonviolence right now than ever before in history. Gandhi and King's life is bearing fruit. Two thirds of the human race are personally involved in grassroots movement of nonviolence. We know that now. And um, Eric and I have as friends, the most prestigious person on the planet, we think, Dr. Erica Chenoweth, who's written, done the research, proved that every violent war or revolution of the last hundred years uh, failed in comparison to nonviolent movements or nonviolent revolutions. She just used math and statistics, so we, we know that it works. But what happened in the Vatican was, uh, we were shocked. I mean, that Cardinal Turkson is asking me to draft Pope Francis' World Day of Peace message. Box Christie got very involved. And we were there in the big session, this was three years ago now, well, <laughs> We, were, we had on the screen, okay, we're gonna issue this statement, getting rid of the just war document, and Cardinal Turkson raised his hand. You only raise your hand when you're gonna break consensus and stop the whole proceedings, and he kept raising his hand. And I, it was, bless me for I have sinned. I was, anyway, it was a thing. And he says, if you write it like this, it's more radical, and you'll really get rid of the just war theory. That's the number two cardinal in the Vatican who was pushing us to go farther in our language. And he said to me in San Diego last year, just war theory is done. The church doesn't realize it now, but Francis and I know that. And it, it takes 100 years for a teaching to begin to enter. But they're testing the waters and trying to figure out how to pitch this to the world. But if you see the fine print, in the last year alone, Francis has gotten rid of any word in any teaching that said you can justify an execution. And he's gotten rid of every word that says, well, maybe you need to have nuclear weapons or you could have nuclear deterrence. That was just in November. That's gone. He's laying the groundwork next for the just war theory and total return to the nonviolence of Jesus. And they're afraid that this could be a schism, but maybe we're already in a schism. The world is so divided. Um, an, uh, another comment or two, and I, then maybe we can wrap it up. In the back, real loud, give us your name. What is my vision of what? What is your vision of world peace? That's a very broad question, but I just wanted to 
That is so nice. Thank you so much. The freshman in the back is asking me my vision of world peace. Well, you know, we really, we really don't know uh, what a world of peace would be like. And yet that's what all the gospel's about. When Jesus is born, the angels appear and start talking about peace on earth. I mean, I could say as a Christian, Jesus is my peace. He's the, he's the embodiment of the God of peace. But that's not what he said. He spent his life talking about something called the kingdom of God, the word which doesn't work for us. Okay, the reign of God, the empire of God. None of those, the language doesn't work. And then Gandhi, if you read the gospels from a Gandhian hermeneutic, it all makes sense. Jesus is talking about a world of total nonviolence. We, so I've spent my whole life trying to imagine this. I think totally when we die, we're going to be met by infinite love. We're going to forgive everyone who ever hurt us. We're going to meet all the people we hurt. We're going to apologize, and we're going to be welcomed into this whole new world, and we're going to wish we had spent our lives getting ready for it now, practicing it. So I, I'm interested, and I write in the book about something I call eschatological nonviolence, which I'm playing with from Merton. Eschatology is the study of the end times. It's a big, highfalutin Greek theology phrase, which basically means to live right now as if you're already in that kingdom of God. I think it's the only way to survive the United States and the violence within each one of us. Uh, to be totally nonviolent to yourself and everyone, and we're practicing for this new life. Or you could talk about the language of resurrection peace. Well, what does that mean? See, Gandhi, and I've studied Gandhi, he thought it actually, he thought it all through. I mean, the UN says this, this, you study it. They just, all the money is there. You just can't have money for you know, trillions of dollars of weapons and justice for the poor on the planet. It's one or the other. We have the money, or well, we're just choosing it to blow up the planet. Like the United States Congress a couple of years ago, totally unanimous, sp spent $1 trillion to upgrade the US nuclear arsenal. And nobody's talking about that, what well, could be done with that money. Well, anyway, what we're talking about is ending hunger. You know, we, we abolish nuclear weapons, cut all this massive military budget, ours was way worse, and use it, even like 10% of that, according to the United Nations, could end world hunger in two weeks. This is not rocket science. It's very doable. It'd be like a new global Marshall Plan. And this is maybe what the great woman is calling the new Green Deal, the Green New Deal, something like that. But you feed everybody, and then you work toward housing, health care, employment, um, clean water for every human being on the planet, which gets, cuts the roots of war, which is injustice, systemic injustice. And then with the infinite money left over, which is totally doable, as every child on the planet goes to school, you educate every human being on the planet from now on in the methodology of nonviolent conflict resolution. Just as you teach them how to read, we don't, we're not born knowing how to read. We have to learn it. I think we have to teach each other nonviolence now because we're brainwashed to be violent. We don't, we don't come out of the womb violent, in my opinion. We're, we're so gentle, nonviolent babies, but we learn violence. So we have to teach nonviolent conflict resolution and then fund it and institutionalize it around the whole planet. This is totally doable. Gandhi talks then in terms of an interim peace teams where you'd send 10,000 unarmed peacemakers to Rwanda or Yemen to help disarm situations, but you don't kill people anymore. Well, this is gonna require a lot of funding and a new vision of creativity. And I hope you will use this great opportunity you have here at this great university to pick the brains of your professors and study Gandhi and Dr. King. And you keep unpacking what would a new a new uh, world of peace look like. I say all this, and I'm trying, I hope I'm not vague, but you know, I did this book on the questions of Jesus. There, there are 350 questions in the four gospels that Jesus asks, and only two of them are answered. Did you know that? It's very cool. So I, I wrote a whole book on that, and of course I offered the answers, but no. Anyway. What's the thing he kept saying over and over? To what can I compare the kingdom of God? How can I describe to you my vision 
of what the world could look like. I like Gandhi's way of talking about a disarmed, nonviolent world, rooted in justice, where finally the scales fall from our eyes, and every human being on the planet recognizes every human being as a sister, as a brother. We're all one, and that we're one with the creatures and Mother Earth. These are the spiritual roots of that vision, and the rest will just be work you know, to unpack it with the social, economic, and political implications of the spiritual truth we're deepening into. Um, thank you for the question. Thank you for being a visionary, and I wish you both especially all the best. Dear friends, you've been very nonviolent. <laughs> thank you for listening to me, and I'm sorry I've gone on and on, but um, I'd be happy to meet all of you, and thanks for getting my books, and onward, and keep resisting. Thank you, Nan and Nancy. All the best to everybody. Thank you so much. Cheers. Thank you.